In this episode, I'm going to talk about typhoid Mary and what typhoid fever is. In part two, I talk about Venustiano Carazano Garza for a bit. Part three is a quick few words on Johannes Brahms. Then I move on to part four where I talk about Paul Kruger and Daniel Salamanca. Part five is the microbiography of Frederick Stanley, 16th Earl of Derby. And then a quick history of the Stanley Cup. And then part six is about Patreon with part seven as just a few bios to look forward to. Way back when I was working on Stonewall Jackson's video, I came across Typhoid Mary. I had always just assumed she was just another comic book character, but not at all. The real person called Mary Malone is the real life Typhoid Mary. This lady migrated from Ireland to the US in 1883 when she was 15. In 1900, she worked in Mamaronock, New York, where within two weeks of her employment, residents developed typhoid fever. I know some of you have no idea what typhoid fever is, so I'll explain. Typhoid fever, also known simply as typhoid, is a bacterial infection due to Salmonella typhi that causes symptoms. Often there is a high fever, weakness, abdominal pain, constipation, and headaches may also occur. Diarrhea is uncommon and vomiting is not usually severe. So in 1901, Mary Malone moved to Manhattan, where members of the family for whom she worked developed fevers and diarrhea. Malone then went to work for a lawyer. She left after seven of the eight people in that household became sick. In 1906, she took a position in Oyster Bay, Long Island, and within two weeks, 10 of the 11 family members were hospitalized with typhoid. She changed jobs again, and similar occurrences happened in three more households. In 1906, one family hired a typhoid researcher to investigate. He believed Malone He believed Malone might be the source of the outbreak. The investigator learned of an active outbreak in a penthouse on Park Avenue and discovered Malone was the cook. Two of the household servants were hospitalized and the daughter of the family died of typhoid. At some point, she was arrested at her workplace by several police officers who took her into custody. Mary attracted so much media attention that she was called Typhoid Mary in a 1908 issue of the Journal of American Medical Association. The New York City Health Inspector determined her to be the carrier. Mary was held in isolation for three years in a clinic located on North Brother Island. Eventually, Mary was freed if she agreed to stop working as a cook and take responsible steps to prevent transmitting typhoid to others. Upon her release, Mary was given a job as a laundress. Years later, she changed her name to Mary Brown and returned to her former occupation. For the next five years, she worked in a number of kitchens. Wherever she worked, there were outbreaks of typhoid. However, she changed jobs frequently. In 1915, Mary started another major outbreak, this time at Sloan Hospital for Women in New York City. 25 people were infected and two died. She again left, but the police were able to find and arrest her. After arresting her, public health authorities returned her to quarantine on North Brother Island on March 27, 1915. Mary spent the rest of her life in quarantine at the Riverside Hospital. On November 11, 1938, she died of pneumonia at age 69. An autopsy found evidence of live typhoid bacteria in her gallbladder. Mary's body was cremated and her ashes were buried at St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx, New York City. While I was working on the video for Philip Sheridan, I found out that Mexico had a revolution from 1910 to 1920. While looking through, I saw the name Pancho Villa, which is already on my list, but found someone else of interest. Veniastano Carranza Garza. He was one of the leaders of the Mexican Revolution, who defeated the counter-revolutionary regime of Victoriano Herta and then defeated fellow revolutionaries. He secured power in Mexico, served as the head of state from 1915 to 1917. He was elected president, serving until 1920. And now, he is also on my nice list. Johannes Brahms was a German composer and pianist of the Romantic period. His reputation and status as a composer is such that he is sometimes grouped with Johann Sebastian Bach and Ludwig von Beethoven as one of the three B's of music. Brahms has been considered by his contemporaries and later writers as both a traditionalist and an innovator. And he was on my list until halfway through the script, I canned it. Whether or not you like his music, his personal life is rather boring. And that's the reason he was dropped from the list. I found out about Paul Kruger, the fifth president of the South Africa Republic, and added him to the list. At the time of his birth, South Africa was a British colony 
He was involved in the Boer War, which I know nothing about except that it happened, so I think that it'll be a cool bio to get to and relate to all of you. Plus, this is a series of biographies from worldwide, so this will help me expand on that sediment. I'm constantly looking for people to add to the list. I don't want it to be a history of humanity for English-speaking people by English speakers. That's why I keep my eyes open and keep looking in different places, which is how I found out about the Choca War between Bolivia and Paraguay from 1932 to 1934. Unfortunately for me, Daniel Samanaka doesn't have enough info to do anything with. He was the 39th president of Bolivia until he was overthrown after losing the Chaka War. I might give the guy a microbiography as an interlude episode though. I had intended on doing a bio for Frederick Stanley, 16th Earl of Derby, but the bio wound up being three and a half pages long and the minimum is five pages. I even tried adding filler about the Stanley Cup, but I retracted it since it's about the cup, not the namesake. So without further ado, here is the bio for Lord Stanley and then some info about the Stanley Cup. Frederick Arthur Stanley was the second son of the Prime Minister Edward Smith Stanley, 14th Earl of Derby. He was born in London, England and was educated at Eden and Sandhurst. He received a commission in the most senior regiment of the British Army's Guards Division, the Grenadiers Guards, and rose to the rank of captain. Stanley married Lady Constance Villers, daughter of the 4th Earl of Clarendon, on the 31st of May, 1864. They had eight sons and two daughters, of whom one son and one daughter died as children. Stanley left the British Army for politics, serving as a conservative member of Parliament. In government, he served as a civil lord of the Admiralty. In 1868, financial secretary to the War Office from 1874 to 1878, secretary to the Treasury in 1878, War Secretary from 1878 to 1880, and colonial secretary in 1885 and 1886. He served as president of the Board of Trade starting in 1886, remaining in that office until he was appointed Governor General of Canada on June 11, 1888. During his term as Governor General of Canada and Commander in Chief of Prince Edward Island, he traveled often and widely through the country. His visit to Western Canada in 1889 gave him a lasting impression of the region's great natural beauty, as well as permitting him to meet the people of Canada's First Nations and many Western ranchers and farmers. Stanley helped cement the non political role of the Governor General when, in 1891, he refused to agree to a controversial motion in the House of Commons. The motion called on him as Governor General to disallow the government of Quebec's Jesuit Estates Act, which authorized paying 400000 Canadian dollars as compensation for land grants to the Jesuits by the King of France. Stanley declined to interfere, saying it was unconstitutional. In holding to that decision, he gained popularity by refusing to compromise the position of political neutrality. After Stanley was appointed by Queen Victoria as Governor General of Canada on June 11, 1888, he and his family became highly enthusiastic about ice hockey. Stanley was first exposed to the game at Montreal's 1889 Winter Carnival, where he saw the Montreal Victorias play the Montreal Hockey Club. The Montreal Gazette reported that he expressed his great delight with the game of hockey and the expertise of the players. Stanley's entire family became active in ice hockey. Two of his sons, Arthur and Algernon, formed a new team called the Ottawa Ridu Hall Rebels. Soon afterwards, Stanley purchased what is frequently described as a decorative punch bowl, but which silver experts identified as a rose bowl, made in Sheffield, England, and sold by London silversmith G.R. Collins and Company for 10 guineas. Stanley never saw a Stanley Cup championship game, nor did he ever present the cup. Although his term as Governor General ended in September 1893, he was forced to return to England on July 15th. In April of that year, his elder brother Edward Stanley, 15th Earl of Derby, died, and Stanley succeeded him as the 16th Earl of Derby. As a result, he left Canada on July 15th, 1893, and returned to England. Back with his family in England, he soon became the Lord Mayor of Liverpool and the first Chancellor of the University of Liverpool. In November 1901, Lord Derby was elected Mayor of Preston. During the last years of his life, he increasingly dedicated himself to philanthropic work. In 1895, Queen's University was the first official challenger for the Stanley Cup, although it was controversial. The Montreal Victorias had won the league title and thus the Stanley Cup, but the challenge match was between the previous year's champion, Montreal Hockey Club. 
and the University Squad. The trustees decide that if, that if the Montreal Hockey Club won the challenge match, the Victorias would become the Stanley Cup champions. The Montreal Hockey Club won the match 5-1, and their crosstown rivals were crowned the champions. The first successful challenge to the Cup came the next year by the Winnipeg Victorias, the champions of the Manitoba Hockey League. On February 14, 1896, Winnipeg defeated the champions 2-0 and became the first team outside the AHAC to win the Cup. In 1908, the Allen Cup was introduced as a trophy for Canada's amateur hockey leagues, and the Stanley Cup started to become a symbol of professional hockey supremacy. Even though Frederick Stanley died on the 14th of June, 1908, age 67, his wife, Lady Derby, later died on the 17th of April, 1922. Prior to 1912, challenges for the Stanley Cup could take place at any time given the appropriate rink conditions and it was common for teams to defend the Cup numerous times during the year. In 1912, Cup trustees declared that it was to be defended only at the end of the champion team's regular season. In 1919, the Spanish influenza epidemic forced the Montreal Canadiens and the Seattle Metropolitans to cancel their series, marking the first time the Stanley Cup was not awarded. Since 1926, no NHL team has played for the Cup, leading it to become the de facto championship trophy for the NHL. In addition, with no major professional hockey league left to challenge it, the NHL began calling its league championship the World Champions. The Stanley Cup was awarded every year until 2005 when a labor dispute between the NHL's owners and the NHL Player Association led to the cancellation of the 2004-2005 season. As a result, no cup champion was crowned for the first time since the flu pandemic of 1919. Adrian Clarkson, then Governor General of Canada, proposed that the Cup be presented to the top women's hockey team in lieu of the NHL season. This idea was so unpopular that the Clarkson Cup was created instead. Stanley's daughter, Lady Isabel Gawthorn Hardy, was mentioned in one of the first games in women's hockey, played at Rudu Skating Rink in 1899. Her role as a women's hockey pioneer is recognized in women's hockey with both the Isabel Gawthorn Hardy Award and the Isabel Cup the National Women's Hockey League's Championship Trophy. For anyone willing to donate some money to Azrael Enterprise, you can actually send your money to the Azrael Enterprise Patreon account. And for every dollar you give, God has entrusted the power of remission into me so that I may remove the burden of, of your sins from you. He has given me the power to save you, but only for those who are willing to pay up. But seriously, the only tier available is for $1 monthly donations. Unlike a televangelist, I'm not greedy. This gives you the ability to be a part of a video making process. I rarely make lists about opinions, but that's what the 100 Greatest series is about. It's about what the patrons think are the 100 Greatest. I have about 50 different topics for the 100 Greatest series, so that means if you don't like the current one, you'll like a future one. I already have completed the first list and have moved on to the second one. If you haven't watched the first one, then go and do that and then sign up for Patreon and help me out. Coming next is Carl Benz, followed by George Westinghouse, Wilhelm Maybach, Alexander Graham Bell, Bram Stoker, Paul von Hindenburg, Thomas Edison, Wyatt Earp, John Kellogg, Vincent van Gogh, John Browning, Nikola Tesla, Felipe Pietion, the Lord Baden Powell, Theodore Roosevelt, Sam Houston, Black Jack Pershing, the CSS Alabama, Henry Ford, Casey Jones, though I do want to point out that the coming soon list can be changed for any reason, including a viewer suggestion, a person not on my full list. And if you'd like to make a suggestion, Leave it in the comment section or fly over to Twitter and tweet it to me.